Hello, everyone. Today we are going to start a new chapter on macroeconomic theory. This lecture will introduce money into open economy models. Different countries have different currencies, so goods, services, and assets are denominated by different currencies. To facilitate international settlements, global financial markets are developed. On completion of this lecture, we are going to follow the learning by doing philosophy and run the trading game. You are challenged to apply macroeconomic theory to investment practice. You may have a great potential as a billionaire fund manager like George Soros. You never know. So let's start the thrilling journey now. We have three learning objectives today. The first is to know how to apply macroeconomics to investment. This must be one of your biggest curiosities when you start learning theory. How can I turn knowledge to money? This long-awaited lecture will show you how. And I hope it can motivate you to learn theory with stronger passion. The second objective is to equip you with the techniques of investment, and the third objective is simply do it. I'm sure many of you may not like risk taking, and so subjectively repulse investment. Can you do without investing? Of course you can. You can simply live on your wage and have a decent life. But if you want to be rich, investment is not a choice but a must. Let's look at an example to show you why we have to invest. Assume you have two choices when you graduate from the university at 22 years old. First, you can choose to be a wage earner at 20k per year after tax, which would be a very good job because it is after tax income. Second. You can choose to be an investor at a 20% rate of return based on the 20k deposit your parents gave you. What does your wealth look like when you're 40 years old? And how about when you retire at 65 years old? Well, initially, the wage earner actually accumulates wealth faster. By 37 years old, the wage earner may already have a semi-detached house in Cardiff. And live a middle-class life, but the investor is still trying hard to catch up. Turning to 65 years old, the wage earner's wealth is 65 minus 22. That is the time of years he can accumulate his wealth. Multiply by 20k every year, which will give 860k of his wealth. Not even a millionaire. So at the best. He can now afford a flat in London. On the other hand, the investor's wealth is, however, about fifty million pounds now. He can buy a house in almost every city in the UK. Well, the difference between these two types of wealth accumulation is the difference between arithmetic series and geometric series. The wage earner's wealth grows in a linear fashion. While the investor's wealth grows in an exponential fashion, the advantage of the investor is that you can use money to earn money, but the wage earner can only use time to earn money. We all know that time is limited; you only have 24 hours a day. But money is infinite. You basically use your time and other people's time to earn more money without any limit. That is why, if you want to be financially free, you must invest. An inevitable result of the difference between the two ways of wealth accumulation is that investors will occupy an increasing proportion of the national wealth. It seems unbelievable, but the richest top one percent account for about seventy percent of the national wealth in the UK in the late nineteenth century. The share declined for a century, down to 15 percent, thanks to the inclusive economic growth after the wars. However, Madame Thatcher's reform in the 1980s empowered the capitalists to polarize the economy, and the share is now about 20 percent. If you want to be the top one percent, then be an investor. 
because you can never become the top 1% by just working. Now assume that you are convinced to do some investment. Then what do we need to know? Well, it is actually simpler than you thought. You have been learning everything needed for the investment. Macroeconomic theory is what you need to use when investing in global financial markets. Just like financial theory is what you needed to use when investing in domestic stock markets. There is a trick to understand all the international financial theory and practice. Just treat a country as a firm and treat the currency as its share. For example, Great Britain pounds are simply shares issued by the UK and US dollars are shares issued by the US. If you think the UK's economy is performing better relative to the US, then you would like to sell USD and buy Great Britain pounds. Let me compare the two types of investment to help you understand. There are three key indicators for picking up any assets. The first one is, of course, profitability. For picking up stocks, you pay attention to the sales and costs of firms. While for picking up currencies, you look at GDP and unemployment. Remember, GDP of a country is just like the sales of a firm, while unemployment is just like costs of input. The second indicator is risk. Stability is preferred for both countries and firms. No one would like to invest in pounds in 2016 for its Brexit uncertainty. That is why pounds crashed on the night of the referendum. The third indicator of investment is liquidity. Your ultimate purpose of investment is to earn a profit rather than holding it forever. For a firm, the debt ratio affects its liquidity when it needs cash. It should not be too high or too low. For a country, money supply is the debt of the central bank and it should not be too high or too low as well because both too high or too low inflation can cause liquidity problems. To summarize, these three key indicators, profitability, risk, and liquidity, basically determine currency values in forex market, just like they determine share price in stock markets. Now let's come to the real business. We mentioned forex market in the previous slide. This is the international money markets, where currencies are exchanged. The full name is therefore called Forex Exchange Market, or Forex for short. A unique feature of Forex market is that there is no baseline denominators for values of currencies. Unlike stock markets within the country, where all stocks are denominated by the same domestic currency, all currency trading is done in pairs, so you always have to buy some currency relative to another currency. There are seven major currency pairs frequently traded in the world, which all contain the US dollars or USD. They are listed here. I will leave it as a small challenge to you to figure out what these symbols mean. For example, you can guess EUR is Euro, but what is JPY, CHF, and CAD? You can pause me now and make sure you get the answer. Apart from these frequently traded major currency pairs, there are cross pairs which do not involve USD, such as EUR slash GBP. This is the exchange between the Euro and Great Britain pounds. And there are exotic pairs which are less frequently traded, such as USD with Chinese Yuan, CNY. Another question I would like you to do research on is, when is the forex market open? You know that stock markets like London Stock Exchange opens at 8 a.m. and closes at half past 4 p.m. on weekdays. How about forex market? When does it open and when does it close? You can pause me now and Google the answer to find it out. 
To be able to trade in forex market, you need to know some basic jargons. First, the exchange rate is defined as the price of one unit of one currency in terms of the other currency. For example, euro slash USD means how much USD is needed to trade for one unit of euro. As another example, USD slash JPY means how much Japanese yen is needed to trade for one unit of USD. The first position of the currency pair is the base, and the second position is the denomination currency to express the price of the base currency. Note that you can either be on the buying side or the selling side of the forex market. So there are always two exchange rates or quotes for the same currency pair. For example, in the euro dollar pair, the selling price of a unit of euro is 1.0425 USD, but the buying price of a unit of euro is 1.0428 US dollars. The difference between the selling and buying prices is obtained by the brokers and dealers in the market as their profit. The last digit of the exchange rate quote is called price interest point or PIP or simply PIP. In the previous example, the PIPs are 5 for the selling price and 8 for the buying price. The gap between the two quotes is therefore 3 PIPs, which is called the spread. A wider spread means a lower liquidity of a currency because you need to pay a higher transaction cost to buy and sell. The Japanese invented the candlestick or K chart to summarize the price change in the given period of time. It contains the following information. In the given period, which can be month, week, day, or even minute, the top tip and bottom tip indicate the highest and lowest quotes, respectively, during this period. If the price rises overall during this period, then the real body is green. The bottom side of the real body is the open quote at the beginning of the period, and the upper side is the close quote. If, on the other hand, the price drops during the period, then the real body is red. The upper side of the real body is the open quote, and the bottom side is the close quote. Note that what I said is a Western convention of coloring. In some Asian markets like mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, the color codes are reversed. Red means a rise, and green means a drop. I will take the European tradition in this lecture, but if you come from other countries, please adjust your color code. Therefore, if the price of an asset, either stock or currency, is rising, then we call it a bullish market. If the price is dropping, then we call it a bearish market. These two jargons are used in the whole world. But there is a joke in China I would like to share with you. They call the Chinese stock market a monkey market because it always jumps up and down with no reason. In investment practice, leverage is frequently used to boost your profit if you are lucky, but it can also boost your loss if you are unlucky. For example, if you only have $50 and you choose to use 100 times leverage, then you are able to buy an asset worth $50 multiplied by 100, which is equivalent to $5,000. If you win, then your profit is multiplied by 100 times with a happy ending. But if you lose, your position will be automatically closed when your loss reaches your deposit of $50. In this case, you will lose the $50 and you lose everything. As you can see, a higher leverage makes it easier for your position to drop below your deposit because it magnifies the fluctuations of your position. 
so a higher leverage means a higher risk of losing all of your money. You should be very careful to use leverage in those so-called monkey markets. Most investment platform also requires you to set the following two parameters whenever you buy or sell an asset. TP stands for take profit. It is a preset price when you want to close the position when you are winning. You can revise the TP later if you want, but it helps you to close the position for you even if you are not watching. For convenience later, let's use a circle symbol to denote the TP price. SL stands for stop loss. It is a preset price when you want to close the position when you are losing. It is similar to TP, but it is to set a limit of your loss when things go at odds with your expectation. It is perfectly normal to have loss. Don't get panic when you are losing money. You can lose a battle but still win the war. So stay calm and make sure you have a good portfolio to spread the risk. Let's use a cross symbol to denote SL price. After introducing the basic jargons, I will briefly tell you some basic techniques for investment. They are generic for forex market, stock market, commodity market or any uh, publicly traded asset market. The key to any investment is to make a good forecast of the future price. The first basic technique is to place a long position when you forecast the market to rise. This is called long but basically it means you buy this asset. For example, you currently have no money and no assets, but you are sure that an asset price is going up. To earn a profit, you can borrow $100 from the bank, then buy this asset at the current price of $100 and set up the take profit or TP at $110. When the future comes, and if you are right, your position closes automatically at $110 and you will get a $10 profit after returning the $100 loan. Well, this is only the case when the market rises as you expected it. If it drops instead, then it would hit the stop loss or SL price. Then you will have a loss equal to the gap between $100 and the SL price. What if you predict the asset price to drop? For example, you can travel back in time to the day before Brexit referendum in 2016. You know Great Britain Pounds is going to crash. Can you do anything to profit on this information? The answer is yes, you can. In a bearish market, you can place a short position. Imagine you have no pounds at hand. You can simply borrow some units of the assets from those who have the assets, pounds. Then you sell it right away at the current price of say $100. In the future, when the price of that asset drops, you can then buy those units back at a preset take profit price, say $90. You can then return the assets and have a profit of $10. Again. It all depends on the correctness of your forecast. If the price rises, then you will end up hitting the stop loss price and have a loss. But we are not God and can't travel back in time. So we don't know if the price of an asset is rising or dropping in the future. There are three types of market analysis to help you make the educated forecast. The first is the so-called fundamental analysis. The macroeconomic theory is designed to do this. Recall that all the analysis you have learned in this module is about the causes and effects. If you see something happens, such as a rise in interest rate, then you can apply macroeconomic theory to analyze the effects on GDP, inflation, unemployment, and so on. And these are the key indicators for the performance of an economy so you can make decisions on longing or shorting on the currency of that economy. For example, 
What would you do if the Federal Reserve in the U.S. is going to raise the interest rate or policy rate? Well, in this case, as we have studied in the new Keynesian model, GDP is going to drop, which is not a good thing for the U.S. economy. So the USD will depreciate. You should place a short position on the USD. Second. What would you do if you focus the unemployment rate of the UK is going down after the pandemic? Well, you would place a long position on Great Britain pounds because lower unemployment is a good thing for the economy. Last, if you knew Brexit would win in the referendum, there would be a greater uncertainty for the UK. So Great Britain pounds would definitely drop. So you should place a short position on Great Britain pounds or GBP. So to summarize, you just analyze the effects of various events on the macroeconomic indicators. If it is a good thing for the economy, then you should long the currency. Otherwise, you short it. As simple as that. The second type of analysis is technical analysis. Different from the fundamental analysis, which focuses on the long-term value of an asset, technical analysis focuses on the short-term fluctuation of the asset price. It usually involves regressions to estimate the 95% confidence intervals as the resistance and support channels. If the asset price are kept within the two channels, then the trend will continue. But once the price of the asset breaks out of the two channels, then the trend will change. If you want to be a good technical analyst, you would need to learn more econometrics. The third analysis is based on market sentiment. You will see the relative shares of long and short positions of an asset in almost all investment platforms. It is more about psychology rather than economics. The sentiment of the market can help you to make a better judgment of the timing based on the pessimism and optimism of the market. Though the three analyses seem to be very complicated, the fundamental analysis is the most fundamental one, because it tells you the trend of the market. That is why macroeconomic theory is so useful in investment practice. In addition to the three types of analysis. Investment bankers and hedge fund managers invented a clever way of reducing risks of making wrong forecast. This is called hedging. It is often used when you are not very sure of the trend, so you open two opposite positions at the same time. Let me show you a practical example of using hedging techniques. Imagine you are standing on the twenty-third June, twenty sixteen. On the referendum day of the UK, everyone knows that there will be a trend of the Great Britain pounds after the referendum result. The Great Britain pounds would either surge or plunge depending on whether the Remain side or the Leave side win. But no one knows which would eventually happen at the time. Is there any way of earning some riskless profit? I use the hedging technique. And won a handsome profit that night. Let me show you how. There are two steps to set up a hedging combination. Step one: you set up a long position with a low stop loss or SL price and a high take profit or TP price, as shown in the green position. This position is to profit on the possibility of a bullish trend. Step two: set up a short position. With a low SL point and a high TP point, as shown in the red position, this is to profit on the possibility of a bearish trend. Therefore, if a rising trend realizes, then the short position hits at the SL first, and then the long position hits the TP later, resulting in a net profit equal to the gap between the TP and SL. On the other hand. If the dropping trend realizes, then the long position hits at the SL first, and the short position hits the TP later, resulting in a net profit again. To summarize, 
no matter which trend actualizes at the end, you can always have a riskless profit. After setting up the hedging combination of positions, you can just sit and lay back and wait for the profit to come. In the case of the referendum, the exchange rate of Great Britain pounds in terms of US dollars was about 1.5 before the final result was released. I set up the hedging positions specified here. Later that night, the dropping trend actualized, as you know. So the long position hits SL of 1.48 first, resulting in a loss of 0 0.02. But the short position hit take profit of 1.4 resulting in a profit of 0.1 per position. So I have a net profit of 0.08 per position. I also used some leverage to boost my profit. With the help of hedging combination, I was anxious free because I knew if a rising trend occurred that night, I would have earned exactly the same profit because my hedging position guaranteed the reverse. To summarize, you don't have to be able to forecast the direction of the market to earn a profit. Sometimes you simply need to know there is a direction. Any trend generating event is a big opportunity to earn a profit in the financial market. So it is a good habit to keep updated with all the big events and apply your macroeconomic theory to understand the possible effects of them and apply hedging techniques to reduce risks. However, it is very important to know what parameter to set for SL and TP. A key principle is not to be too greedy. Don't be overconfident, which can bias your judgment. But I'm sure you won't listen. Only a big failure will teach you a lesson. So for now, let's learn by doing. Please register yourself following the link provided and do some trading in real time with the virtual money. You are welcome to use your actual money later on when you are ready, but this is done at your own risk. Never invest the money that you cannot afford to lose. Have fun!